Hello, everybody. This is Kelly Friedlander. We'll be starting in just a minute. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Health, Person-Centered Living, and Individual Support, What's the Connection webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today, we are fortunate enough to hear from Karen Lucan, Project Director. This webinar is being sponsored by the North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities and North Carolina Money Follows the Person Project. Thank you both so much for your generous support. Some quick housekeeping items before we begin. Currently, everyone is on mute. We do have the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Please enter questions that you would like the presenter to answer there throughout the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we have some time built in to answer as many questions as possible. Slide handouts and a recording of the webinar will be available on the DD Council website, nccdd.org next week. In addition, a recording of this webinar will be sent out with a survey for you to complete after the webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete this short survey. Your feedback helps us make sure that we are providing you with useful information. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter today, Karen Lucan. Good afternoon. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to spend some time with you. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to the North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities, which has been providing core funding for the Medical Health Home Initiative. That is a partnership between the ARC of North Carolina, the Autism Society of North Carolina, and Easter Seals UCP, and most importantly, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their families, disability providers, and our healthcare partners. Um, we also received some support from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and VIA Health, as everyone is invested in the issues surrounding integrated care and Medicaid transformation. Today, I think I'll tell you some things you know, which hopefully reinforces your experiences in your approach to health and person-centered living. I hope that I provide you with some new information, new resources, which we'll address specifically toward the end of the webinar, and that this is an opportunity to reflect on how you as an individual provider, administrator, family member, advocate can help move our system forward to achieve health, person-centered living, and individualized supports. So we'll begin to move through our slides now. Um, the next slide, it takes a moment, I think, for things to shift. Let me try that again. Kelly, I'll ask for some assistance as the slide did not move. So this is a chance for all of us to take a deep breath as we go forward. Um, so this next slide is called, It's About Perspective. And I think much of our discussion today is health, person-centered living, um, supported living is really about perspective. Um, what you see in front of you, if you're able to look at the slides at this moment, is the parable of the elephant and how different people um, can have distinctly different perceptions of the same thing. So we have a group of individuals, each standing by one part of the elephant, they happen to be blindfolded, so they're feeling some part of the elephant's tusk or ear or tail or trunk or side, and what they're perceiving is influenced by what's immediately in front of them. So the side of the elephant feels like a wall, the trunk feels like a snake, the tusk feels like a spear, 
the leg can be perceived as a tree. The ear may be thought to be a large fan and the tail might be considered to be a rope. When we think about health, when we think about person-centered living, I think sometimes our perspectives are very much shaped by our experiences and the way we communicate about health and quality of life. So as we go through this webinar and as you reflect on how you're providing supports and services to enable someone to achieve supported living goals, attain quality health, um, think about your perspective, their perspective, and the other parts of the system that you need to pull in. Um, Another way to think about this is we can probably all identify an example or a time when someone's, in quotes, behavior, person with an intellectual and developmental disabilities behavior changed, and how that was perceived may depend very much on the perspective of the person. That behavior change might be seen as evidence of a psychiatric problem rather than the person's experiencing dental pain and needs an immediate oral health appointment. The person may have undergone a recent life stressor, a move, death of a family member, loss of a valued staff person. That disrupts their sleeps, but that's not understood in the full context. Um, or perhaps the person has had new medications and they've had a lot of side effects. But again, the perspective may be very much viewed by your role and your life experiences. So as we talk about health, it's important to understand health care contributes to health, but we're not just going to be talking about health care, but really how health is a, an essential part of person-centered living to support a given individual. As we think about our work, it's always necessary to think about the individual. The person is at the center of what we do. An important study was conducted by Dr. Tamar Heller from the University of Illinois Rehabilitation and Research Training Center that specializes in issues around developmental disabilities. She conducted a series of focus groups and interviews with adults with IDD in Illinois to get their perspectives on Medicaid managed care. Many states are making the change to managed care. And what does this mean? What are people's concerns? Um, so what Dr. Heller did was ask two critical questions of adults. What is their definition of good health? And in the next slide, we'll look at what is their definition of good health care? Because they're different. Good health was displayed by the individuals as the ability to perform the activities one wants to do, a central element, I think, of supported living and person-centered living. The absence of pain, disease, and symptoms, being able to follow through on treatment or not needing treatment because they could manage their particular health condition, being able to perform physical self-care, and also mental and spiritual self-care. What I think is really important is that when we're talking with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, do we ask them how they define good health and ask them to rate their health, but more importantly, how can we help them improve their health over time? What are the challenges? What are the assets that they have to achieve good health? Often when we talk about health, we actually shift very quickly into a discussion about health care. So in this next slide, deep breath while we're waiting for the slides to advance, we're going to see what adults with IDD defined as good health care. Because again, health care is necessary to achieve good health, but it is distinct. So good health care was defined as ensuring my needs are met through access to services, that wide array of health care services that we all need, that health care is timely, of high quality, and there's continuity of care. So it isn't just that first point of access of getting a doctor or having that doctor's name on your Medicaid card, but it's actually quality and being able to have continuity of care with a trusted professional. Being able to attain quality services across an array of health arenas, 
primary care, specialty care, mental health, dental care. Being able to navigate the healthcare system successfully, which we know is very, very challenging. Our healthcare system, our disability system, our social service system is very fragmented, and it's often confusing for an individual, their family, the provider system to even know how to help someone navigate across the healthcare system. What I think is most important is this last statement. Good healthcare is defined as receiving humanizing healthcare. So I don't just want healthcare, I want humanizing, which we would say would be person-centered care. So as we think about supported living, how do we ensure that someone receives humanizing healthcare in order to achieve good health? Much of our discussion within Medicaid transformation, healthcare, disability services often revolves around models, best practices, terminology. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to define some models, take a look at some terms, because again, thinking back to the parable of the elephant, our perspective, our way of communicating can influence how we access health and achieve good health. So three of the very established models of health are offered on the next slide. The medical model, which most of us are familiar with, views the body as a machine that at times may be broken and needs to be fixed. Historically, people with disabilities have often encountered a medical model where the focus was on what is wrong and how do we fix this. Um, obviously, we can encounter health problems, so people with disabilities do have health problems such as diabetes, paralysis, spasticity, but how do we understand those health concerns, not as they are broken, but rather how do we help them attain good health? The medical model does talk about the absence of disease and does focus on high levels of function. So it's a, we certainly want people to be able to function to the best of their ability and do that in the environment, the supported living opportunities that will support them. Many healthcare providers have been trained on the medical model, so their perspective may be how do we fix something rather than as we look at the next two models. The holistic model was developed by the World Health Organization and the definition is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So it introduced the idea of positive health. So a shift from the fixing of problems but one area of concern within the WHO definition is the statement complete. So again, if someone is not viewing an individual with a disability as able to obtain complete physical, mental, and social well-being, that perspective may inform how they think about offering them health care or what they think are reasonable health goals. Um, an evolving model that is now in play is the wellness model, which focuses on how does health become our resource for everyday life. It focuses again on positive concepts and it emphasizes social and personal resources while maximizing an individual's physical capacities and ability to function in the environment of their choice. I think this is a good fit as we think about supported living and person-centered living. So Again, thinking of perspectives, is the healthcare provider that you're interacting with focused or trained in a specific model? How do we encourage broadening the model to include elements of the wellness model? And you might also want to stop and think, what's your approach? What model are you using as you think about health? A few other terms that we'll take a quick look at as we're talking about person-centered living and supported living are ensuring that person-centered living is a concept that we share with others within healthcare and other parts of our service system, that they understand the focus is on choice, belonging, and the ability to optimize one's health and well-being. 
So person-centered living allows us to move just from the biomedical model to the more holistic wellness model. Individualized supports, which is part of our focus today, should enable the person to live their life in their community of choice, but that may require a flexible range of supports and services that are very much tailored to their individual needs, their individual community, and are determined by the person. So as we think about health, what individualized supports may be necessary for some of the individuals that you're providing services to, or as a family member, or as an advocate that you are caring for, loving, supporting in their community of choice. How do we truly make sure that an individualized approach is available? There's been considerable discussion recently about the concept of social determinants of health. Um, this acknowledges that the majority of our health is actually influenced outside of the, in quotes, doctor or medical appointment. Research says that 60 to 70 percent of our health is determined by where we live. There's a lot of research now on that geography and zip codes have a bigger influence on our health than many other factors. Our access to healthy food, the quality of the housing we're able to reside in, access to transportation, our levels of employment, our educational outcomes, these social determinants of health have a huge influence on the ability to achieve quality health. I think in the developmental disabilities community, this makes perfect sense and has been a strong focus of our work. Um, and yet, it may be a newer approach to some within the healthcare arena. Um, I also think that it's important to know that an evolving area of research is now looking at what is considered essential needs. What is essential for a person so that they feel wanted, feel able to achieve their personal goals? So again, as we think about supported living, what are the essential needs for that individual, both within their health care and more importantly within their health arena? Um, I'd like to encourage you, whoops, there we go, to check out a, okay, having a few glitches here. Um, we should be on the slide, person-centered thinking. I apologize for that. I'd encourage you to check out a webinar, and it's referenced at the end of the presentation today, on person-centered thinking by Mary Lou Bourne. Um, she presented to the National Center for START Services, and what I think is important about this representation is the acknowledgement that as we build a person-centered system, moving from just the individual that we're providing care or services to, and we think about building our system, which is clearly the goal of Money Follows the Person, the Supported Living Initiative, the work that the Medical Health Home Initiative is doing, what are the essential elements to build this person-centered system? Um, core values, I think, are very clear within person-centered principles, practice, thinking, and planning. How do we ensure those values are retained and we share those values with others? Language, I think, is something that we often neglect and was part of why I wanted to spend a little bit of time on what is good health, what is good health care, how do we think about some of these critical models? Often our language, our terminology is known to us, and yet the person we're talking with may be defining those terms differently. So ensuring that we're using common language or explaining our terminology will allow us to have a broader perspective. The person-centered system should enable the individual and policymakers to make the right decisions leading to the right actions so that the individual and the system achieves the results that are desired, again on an individual and a systems level, and that we continue to monitor so that we can change and improve over time. Again, I think this is reinforcing what you know, but it may be helpful to talk with other people about core values and language in order to achieve the right actions and results. 
So as we kind of think about the importance of values, I wanted to take a moment to state, I think what we would all endorse and may help us in some of our communication with our partners. Um, it's important, I think, to acknowledge that health is not static. It is dynamic and moves back and forth on a continuum throughout our lifetime. An example might be, if I have a poor night of sleep, how I look, how I function that next day will obviously be impacted. If I have a chronic health condition, such as asthma, the impact of the weather, the impact of the environment, the recent hurricane would clearly have an impact on my health. If someone sees me at a given point in time, that really is a snapshot. So as we're supporting individuals to achieve person-centered living, it's important that the people they're interacting with who may be making judgments about their health and their capabilities are reminded that health changes and that at any given point in time, it really is one snapshot. We know that everyone has the right to the best possible health status and quality of life, and this is a central element, I think, of all of our work, those core values. I believe strongly that everyone needs to know how to protect, preserve, and improve their health. For some individuals, the protection may be where we're starting. How do we help them with very basic health outcomes and access to basic health care? Once they've achieved some desired health outcomes, how do they preserve that initial level of stability? And then over time, how do we help them improve their health from an individual self-determined perspective? Research does show us that person-centered care is associated with improved quality of care and outcomes, so we need to remind others of that, that our emphasis on the person, person-centered living, will improve quality and will improve outcomes on an individual and a systems level. But for this to happen, health needs to be a shared value, not just the purchasing of health care, but valuing health as a critical element needs to be emphasized and shared. Wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about the system. Many of us have been part of the system for many years as providers, as educators, as researchers, as policymakers. Many of you have had to interact with the system in order to gain access to services. Um, so it's important to acknowledge some of the limitations and challenges that the system can present. Service systems have often been geared towards overprotection, feeling responsible for, and thus may at times limit the person's opportunities for growth, informed choice, and dignity of risk. So when you think about individuals, particularly those who may have lived in an institutional environment, the system may have been designed to protect them, but that has limited their opportunities for choice and learning from the dignity of risk. Systems have a tendency to sometimes go overboard with this protection and focus on keeping people safe and watching over and providing comfort. Clearly, safety is critical, but that does not mean that people are not allowed to learn, experiment, and move through developmentally appropriate stages of life. Um, I think one of the ways that our system has illustrated this overprotection is I can think back to the days when person-centered plans, the box actually was health and safety. Health and safety are different. They're both critical, but they're very different. But by putting them together, there was a tendency to focus on the safety and health became a very narrow concept, I think. So people with disabilities, I think we know, may be experienced poor in having had appropriate health education in school, in being able to do some of the developmental tasks and milestones that allow us to make mistakes and learn. So as you go through supported living, those of you that have done work with the informed decision making, I think it, we acknowledge that 
people's experiences may be limiting, so how do we change that? How do we let them learn, practice, experiment, and grow? And health is often one of the areas where people have had very limited control. So we know and believe that people must have opportunities, they must be given respectful support so that they have the authority to exert control in their lives and health must be part of that. I think this leads naturally to a discussion or reflection on how do we balance important to and important for, a very critical element of person-centered planning and living and an essential element, I think, of supported living. Um, so how do we, for a given individual, understand their dreams, help them identify their talents, ensure that they're with people that they want to be with and that people circle can expand over time, that they're in the places that matter to them, that they have a sense of purpose in their daily life and as they make their life plans, that they have status as an individual in their community and family, that they have a chance to try on different roles, that their health is supported, and that safety is considered. This list may be in a different order for different people, but as we think about supported living, how do we ensure that all of these balancing requirements can be considered and always start with where does the individual want to begin, where do they feel they need to begin? Where might they achieve some initial successes that help build the foundation for moving forward? I think in your interactions with the healthcare community, it may be an important concept back to core values and language to introduce important to and important for. If a provider has been accustomed to the medical model and the prescribing of health, a discussion on how we want to expand that to a more holistic approach and an educational approach so that the person is making decisions about what is important to them and what is important for them. We know that individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities often have a variety of factors that can impact their health. Some are on an individual basis and some are systems. Again, we're waiting for the slide to advance. Each of these is a chance for some relaxation and deep breaths. Okay, so a domino effect can happen when an individual with an intellectual and developmental disabilities is contending with a variety of factors. So as I go through this slide, I'd ask you to maybe think about someone that you care about, you're providing services to, that you support. And which of these factors may be having a significant impact on that individual's health and ability to live the person-centered life they choose? Um, research tells us, and your personal experience probably reinforces, that people with IDD often have less access to preventive care, such as recommended health screenings, and quality, developmentally appropriate health promotion. Many individuals with disabilities deal with issues of overweight and obesity, risk factors for diabetes. Are they provided developmentally appropriate health promotion that enables them to learn how to manage their risk factors and make lifestyle changes? Um, one of the resources at the end will be specific to diabetes self-education. There are a lot of really good community-based diabetes prevention programs. How do we make those relevant and available to adults with DD? And how do we ensure that within the healthcare arena, people are getting the right preventive care based on age, sex, and other risk factors? Um, many healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, et cetera, have had inadequate training about the healthcare needs of adults with IDD. They may have been trained in the medical model. They may have had very limited lectures that focus on diagnosis, complications, and that small part of the continuum with very significant problems. So they may need to have us as advocates and family members and providers 
give them resources that help them understand living with a disability, be it cerebral palsy, spina bifida, Down syndrome, what the healthcare needs may be, and people's ability to live with a disability with that holistic and wellness model. And there will be some specific resources referenced at the end of today. Some individuals with IDD may themselves be challenged with recognizing health concerns, understanding what's happening, and being able to communicate that. So an individual with newly diagnosed diabetes may not understand when there are warning signs about changes in their insulin level. An individual with a family history of congestive heart failure may not know how to communicate when they think they're having heart issues. So how do we help individuals learn about their body and their health so that they can appropriately interact with the healthcare system? We all know that it's challenging to find adequate mental health and dental services. These are usually the two areas identified by individuals and families as the most challenging, and yet they're very critical to whole person care, and they are a focus of integrated care. So finding competent providers, finding accessible facilities is really a critical issue. Many individuals with IDD are unemployed or underemployed, so they have limited income, which then impacts access to healthy foods, the opportunity to be socially engaged in their community, um, and those risk factors we know more and more about from that social determinants of health perspective can have a significant impact on health. Research and experience tells us that individuals with disabilities are at heightened risk for abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, neglect. There is considerable focus now in our system on trauma. How do we ensure that we are appropriately screening for trauma and abuse and then following through with the appropriate services to support someone? How do we help? the healthcare community partner with us around abuse so that we are appropriately protecting but not limiting all of the individual's choices around relationships, the opportunity to live alone. Um, social and attitudinal barriers continue and there are many social misperceptions about individuals capacities, abilities, how do we challenge those and support the individual to make those challenges, be it voting, relationships, living independently. And even though the Americans with Disabilities Act has been in play for more than 25 years, we continue to deal with mobility and access barriers. That might be barriers within the person's residence, within the medical environment, within the social places they would like to go. So as you think about a given person, which of these boxes may be the appropriate place to start and what resources do you need to begin to move things forward? You may be working on an individual level with a person or you may be responsible for systems level changes. Hopefully the resources at the end will offer you some follow-up information and contacts. Um, this quote is from Dr. Beth Marks, a professor of nursing, the principal investigator and lead author for the Health Matters curriculum, um, also available through the University of Illinois at Chicago, which is a developmentally appropriate health education resource designed with and for adults with DD to learn about physical activity, nutrition, and staying healthy. I think Beth's quote is particularly relevant as we think about supporting individuals to live in the communities of their choice. Staying healthy requires a collective effort, social support, and environments where healthy choices are made av available and easy to make. If we take the example of an adult with diabetes and the importance of healthy eating and physical activity, it makes sense that their environment is designed to make health easy. That does not mean we take control and 
choose all of their foods, lock the cabinets, limit what they're able to do when they go out. It means helping them establish their environment in their apartment where health is an easier choice. Again, I think we know this from a common sense perspective, but sometimes things become too focused on control and protection. Oop, let's go back to the individual barriers briefly. Okay, I'm going back one slide. So some of the barriers that individuals encounter are noted on this table with some possible solutions. So these next two slides are designed to help us think about on an individual or micro level, how can I support health and enable the person to have quality of life? And then next we'll look at it from a systems level. So if an individual has difficulty communicating their health concerns, how do we help them prepare for appointments? There will be some resources at the end that focus on this. And it's important to talk about health throughout the year not just the day of the doctor's appointment, not just the day before the person-centered plan, but health is a critical part of achieving supported living goals, person-centered planning outcomes, focusing on health ongoing. Many individuals have had negative health experiences. It may be through hospitalization, emergency department visits, um, invasive or difficult medical treatments. So it's important, again, that we understand that person's perspective. Going to the doctor, in quotes, can mean very different things to different people. Do I understand their health experiences? Have there been traumatic events? How might a peer support be helpful to them so that as a woman who is preparing for a mammography appointment can talk to another woman who's had that appointment manage the appointment and can explain to her what will happen and help her understand the importance of it. Many individuals lack resources to enable them to follow through on their personal health goals. How do we address that through community outreach? Um, health education is a critical issue, but often it's not available in formats that can be used by the individual or the appointments with a medical provider are so brief and rushed that the individual doesn't feel able to take that information in and understand how to apply it to their lives. Do we ask for longer appointments? How can we get information in multiple formats, be it large print, visuals, audio, where are the best practice resources so that the individual can learn and be supported to be healthy? And most of us are challenged by understanding medical orders and recommendations, which may come at the end of a very quick appointment. Asking the provider to write out instructions, explain them perhaps more than once, and then checking back to make sure the individual understands or those that are supporting them can reinforce this as time goes forward. When we think about barriers, it's also important to acknowledge that the system can present barriers to us. Um, we've talked about inaccessible facilities and medical equipment. Many individuals who use power wheelchairs and have very limited ability to transfer independently talk about going to the doctor's office and never being weighed because of inaccessible scales. They talk about going to doctor's appointments and never having a full body exam on the medical examination table. All of those things will significantly impact what the healthcare provider can learn about the individual. So we need to push for compliance with the ADA, accessible facilities and medical equipment, and then also share particular accessibility and accommodation needs prior to an appointment. We talked about the lack of disability education for healthcare providers earlier. Typically in any community, we know who the good providers are that everybody hopes to see. That will not help us build systems capacity though. If everybody only goes to see Dr. Kelly, Dr. Kelly is going to become overloaded. So how do we help build that system so that in a given community, there are more providers that are competent, comfortable, 
and caring and can provide the right care? What educational resources can we bring to those providers? How do we make sure that the system, be it the practice or the individual provider, does not just focus on the disability, but as the young woman in her mid-20s goes to her appointment, it isn't just the diagnosis on her problem list, but she's a young woman in her 20s living alone is there talk about reproductive health and sexuality, helping the individual organize their information prior to an appointment so they can ask the questions that are of concern to them, and making sure that chronic health issues are not overlooked, that there are age and gender specific concerns around cancer screenings, immunizations, making sure that these are addressed. So at this point, uh, we are fortunate to, I hope, have um, Matt Revis from Turning Point Services, an agency that is involved in the Supporting Living Initiative, share a personal story for an individual that um, the system, in quotes, could perhaps not appropriately support to be healthy. So again, I will advance the slide and ask if Matt is on the call. Good afternoon, folks. Can Thank I, you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Well, at least you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk briefly uh, about a fairly simple example of uh, the intersection of uh, supported living, um, somebody making their own choices and living their own life, and, and health issues. Uh, this fella came to us. Um, he started supported living in August, the beginning of August this year. Uh, he had been living with his family and then uh, had been uh, living in a AFL, alternative family living situation. <clears throat> but he wanted his own place. And so a great group of people got together, including his sister and some uh, wonderful staff people that we have at Turning Point, including a special ed teacher, God bless him, and find as many as you can and hire them. And he moved into his own place on August the 1st. <clears throat> One of the things that happens when people start living on their own and making their own choices is that there can be some surprises that come up. And this is an example of uh, how that can happen. Uh, this fellow's got a lot of energy and a lot of drive. He doesn't really have any chronic health conditions. He's in his mid-20s. He's pretty healthy and clever and assertive in his own way. Um, but within the first month of him moving in, and let me say he was so excited about living in his, his own place that he mowed the yard three times the first day he was there. Uh, I hear that his house is spotless and remains that way. So we're talking about somebody with a lot of energy and a lot of focus. Within the first month after he'd moved into his place, uh, the people around him noticed that he seemed to be gaining weight and indeed he had gained a small amount of weight. And in talking to him about it, they found out <clears throat> that he was, when he was alone, part of that focus would all, was also extending to food. And so he might eat a, a bowl of cereal, decide that it was good, and decide that he was going to eat all the cereal in the house. Or have a cookie and decide that it was great and decide he was going to eat all the cookies in the house. And for a young man his age and his energy level, that's not so bad, except continue that for weeks, months, and years at a time, and suddenly you do have a pretty good health issue to deal with. Uh, luckily, he's got some wonderful people around him, and they started talking to him about this and decided to do try a couple of interventions that uh, he, he was okay with. Um, one of the first things they did was uh, start shopping for food more often uh, and buying smaller quantities of food so that if he did get stuck in one of these uh, eating events, it wouldn't be quite as much as what had been purchased before. Um, one of the second interventions was uh, the uh, 
qualified professional involved started putting together uh, picture cards uh, to um, visualize what portion control might be, um, good meal combinations, good snack portions and sizes and things like that and working with him to develop the picture cards that he could need and keep in his kitchen and, and help him begin to control uh, how much he's eating. Um, they're also experimenting with, I don't think I brought this up, Karen, I, they also have been experimenting with online ordering of groceries that he would then go pick up, and that's mostly because he's interested in that. Uh, so they've started those three interventions, and I, and I can't say that he's lost the weight that he gained, uh, but he has not gained any more weight. At the same time, he's still controlling, making decisions about the food that he wants to eat, and through the picture card process, is learning how to control the portions and develop balanced meals. I I I would say that this really fits in with uh, the wellness model that Karen was talking about. Because what this team has done is pulled together the social and personal resources that this fellow have, has so that he can maintain his health in a manner that makes sense to him. And I think that's about it. I think this is a good example of how the system could have said, well, we need to protect and take over to prevent a problem and we'll plan, we'll buy, we'll cook, we'll lock up. And there would have been many intrusive ways that the system would have taken control in order to protect the individual's health. What Matt's describing is an individual who is capable of living on their own, is facing some challenges, and how to proactively engage with the person as to how to manage their health and their living situation, um, focusing on a holistic and wellness approach. Continuing to teach in your interventions, but doing it in a very person-centered, individualized way, rather than a referral to a static health ed program, which may not be where the individual would find a, the best fit. I think the idea of ordering um, groceries is a good example of that is high status in our society. People order, come up, and you pick up your food. It's what many individuals do in our communities, as well as ordering prepared meals. So how do we look at the community at large approach to um, a health diet related issue and explore those opportunities. Um, so I appreciate that example. Well, one of the things that you had mentioned before, Karen, was uh, uh, <clears throat> the freshman 15. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's not unusual for young people when they're moved out of a, a sort of a, you know, as I said, he'd been living with his family or in a family type environment where I believe that he he could choose what he wanted to eat, but I'm sure that there were implicit controls on portions that, that when you have the freedom to do whatever you want to do, well, there's some learning that has to take place. Uh, we were lucky that this fellow is in pretty good health to begin with and that he's also, uh, he learns quickly and is eager to learn. So that that's really going to keep this as a simple problem, but it's really kind of cool that it happened so quickly that people People were around him to notice, to pay attention, and then to make sure that they could give him the support that he needed to continue to live in his own place without causing a simple health problem. And I think this is a good example of how do you help someone preserve their health? They have good health. How do we help them preserve it and work on improving it? So it isn't always that protective um, stepping back. It's how do we ensure the individual stays healthy and continues to identify what their desired health outcomes are over time. Um, I want to step you through a couple more slides to share a few resources that may be helpful to you. 
Um, the next slide will show you some resources that have come specifically from the developmental disabilities world. Some are developed by the University of South Florida, My Health Passport, and My Health Report. These are available online, public domain, and you can use them to help an individual organize their health information for their own learning as well as to share with healthcare providers. Or it's a way if they are receiving some support perhaps from just direct support professionals to convey what their health history is. The Vanderbilt Kennedy Center is renowned for its focus on health care for adults with IDD. They have a phenomenal toolkit that focuses on what primary care providers need to know. So thinking back to that, how do we expand the education that medical and health care providers have? This is a really good toolkit. They also have videos and it's based on the work done at the Surrey Place Center in Canada, which also has very good resources for individuals, families, and healthcare providers. So I would encourage you to check that out. The next slide offers you some specific resources on oral health, such an important issue that we know more and more about as being central to protecting and preserving our health. Georgetown University has some really good resources there. The American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry is the national group for medical and dental providers. They have educational resources. You'll see a lot of crossover as you begin to look at some of these websites, but they have a series of educational um, content for physicians and nurses at which they can obtain CEUs. The Center for START Services has a national online training series. That's where the person-centered planning event is noted. And one of the critical things that we emphasize in our initiative and I think is part of quality health care to achieve quality health is having a primary provider, a medical home, and the patient-centered medical home offers some really good consumer education about what is a medical home, why is it important, how can it work for me. This, I think, is critical because sometimes in our disability communities, we know the disability system, but we may not know the healthcare system, and we may need to educate ourselves on how to interact and partner with the medical home. The last slide of resources talks about Health Matters, which is the health education curriculum developed by Dr. Beth Marks, um, and it has a variety of resources. Um, one of the things they have moved towards is developing resources that focus on community organizations and staff so that they can support individuals. I know that Turning Point Services and others in the VIA network um, utilized Health Matters as part of a quality improvement project. So you can utilize Health Matters for group education as well as individualized supports. The ARC of New Jersey has a program on preventing, understanding, and living with diabetes that's specifically for individuals with DD. And the Self Advocates website, Self Advocate Net, has information on health, sexuality, nutrition, and physical activity. I think a focus on sexuality is often missing. When you look at the University of South Florida resources, they do provide space for an individual to ask questions about reproductive health and sexuality, which I think is a critical area that is often overlooked. Um, so I think as we focus on health, person-centered living, and individualized supports, our responsibility is to convey hope. This quote on the next slide from an unknown author, um, it's never too early or too late to work toward being the healthiest you. So when we think about helping an individual protect, preserve, and improve, wherever they are in their life situation, it's never too early or it's never too late to begin to take that focus on health. Um, there is a cartoon that um, is part of the summary. Um, I think supported living is hope, hoping and working on opening doors 
but we have to make sure that all doors are open, that the door to health is really critical because otherwise the individual is likely to fail at some point. So how do we continue to push and make sure that all doors are open? Um, I think that's what you're doing in the Supported Living Initiative, in Money Follows a Person, in many of the work that we're doing. Um, and the last slide is my contact info. So as you continue to do your work, let me know if there are resources you're looking for, if you ha have stories that you'd like to share with us. And I'll turn it back to Kelly. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate it. Um, the, the few questions we got were about copies of the presentation and also um, a request to email out the resources. So what I'll do is in the follow-up email for this presentation, I'll actually copy and paste the resources um, list that Karen just went over, so those are easily in your email. You'll also receive a PDF version of this PowerPoint and the recorded version of this webinar. So hopefully that, that's helpful. If there's anything else, you can feel free to email Karen or myself. We have about five minutes left. Are there any other questions that individuals have for Karen? A lot of people saying thank you. <laughs> so that's great. We're, you guys are finding this helpful. I will update the slides for you, Kelly, and add our newly launched website because that will also be a place that you can continue to return to for resources. So I'll add that info to the last slide, Kelly, and get that back to you today. Perfect. So that, that um, information will go out via email to everyone who's registered for this webinar. Um, I have one question here. Oh, a couple ones. Um, how can we encourage the system to continue to change more to a holistic and wellness model? I think advocacy is one of our responsibilities so that in our conversations with administrators, state government, policymakers, we need to continue to share examples of the outcomes achieved through whole, whole person care. So I think stories are one way that we do that, but also understanding some of the outcomes that matter and how we can partner together to collect outcomes, be it the provider agency, the family, the LMEMCO, um, outcomes and data are going to matter to the system so how do we understand what outcomes to track um, there's a focus often on hospital days and preventing emergency department hospitalization and those are two elements but i think if we look at the story matt shared how would that story resonate with different audiences what's their perspective and how do i need to help them understand the value of this approach to whole person care. So I think we have to partner together to share some of our stories. Great, thank you so much. Okay, oh, a couple more questions. A lot of people saying this is an extremely helpful presentation and thanking you, Karen. Um, one of the questions is, is there going to be a future webinar on dignity of risk and sexual relationships with supported living? Now, this is an area that a lot of providers are struggling with. Um, I will bring that back to VIA um, and see if it is a webinar that they are interested in having. We have two more web webinars scheduled for the remainder of the year, but that is definitely something that we could look at slating in the spring. And I think that's a great topic. So thank you for the suggestion. Um, another question. My concern centers around language. My son asks how to get unstuck. And I'm, I'm assuming you mean unstuck in the service system, Kathy? I don't know, what would you recommend, Karen, for, for self-advocates who are trying to move forward to living independently in the community? Um, I think this is a good example of understanding a person's perspective and language. What does unstuck mean? What is it that they're wanting to move towards so that then we can hopefully identify the appropriate resources and supports. Um, 
So I think in some ways it's an individualized conversation, but I think it does go to language, desired outcomes, and where's either the critical place to start or this is where we'll start because we can achieve some success. So not knowing the individual's story, I'm not sure how to get more specific. So I may be too vague and I apologize for that. Okay, Kathy, if you want to follow up, you can email myself or Karen and we'll try to, uh, to walk through your question with you. Um, to respect everyone's time and calendars, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this webinar at this time. Karen, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It seems like this really struck a chord with a lot of our attendees and we appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Um, just a reminder, if everyone would please complete the survey that will be sent out to you shortly today, that really helps us make sure we're providing you with information and resources that you find helpful. And once again, this webinar and the PowerPoint will be made available on the North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities website. Thank you all and have a fabulous day. I want to say thank you to Matt and also if you have resources you think are best practices, please share with me because that helps me expand my knowledge base. So I would appreciate feedback from you all. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great day.